Reactor online. Sensors online. Weapons online. All systems nominal. Hello everyone, your favorite Kenobi and Cat Girl Carrie here, coming to you from the deep periphery on deployment at an undisclosed Torian world. Oh, I mean, forget the last part. Anyway, today we are talking about a few things, and before we get into the topic of this episode, which is more like, well, two topics in one, let's talk about the news. First of all, the Starlink Command Lance and Urban Mech Lamp salvage boxes have finally hit retailers. These retail for $34.99 for the Command Lance and $29.99 for the Urban Mech, but are available from our sponsor, Fortress Miniatures and Games, for $26.24 and $22.49, respectively. I have done a review of the Star League Command Lance, and you can find that on our YouTube channel, Unicorn Company uh, Podcast. Also, we are apparently waiting on just a few things before the Kickstarter orders begin to ship out, so it looks like we may still be on track to see them start shipping this month after the delay involved in getting the clan invasion kickstarter models out there this seems like a tiny tick on a clock in comparison catalyst also released a vulture recently released a vulture premium mini and has a wolverine premium mini waiting in the wings the vulture is 14.99 at the catalyst web store and 20 at fortress I don't have the best opinion about this mini, and you can see why when I release the review on YouTube next week. I would honestly say that in this case, though, it is better to just buy the force pack with it in it or to pick up one of the plastic minis on the secondary market. And speaking of miniatures, our friends at Ironwind Metals recently released sculpts of the Archer and Rifleman, which are in line with the new sculpts from Catalyst. These are $19.95 for the Archer and $18.95 for the Rifleman, which can actually make two different variants. And they are available, you know, through Fortress Miniatures at a discount. I will have video reviews coming out on the YouTube channel in the coming weeks for both of these models. Finally, and tangentially related to Battletech, Gale Force 9 plans on releasing a limited release set of Hextech Terrain, and Acid House Terrain will soon be doing a Kickstarter for terrain that is compatible with games like Battletech. As those develop, I will definitely bring you more updates on those. Also, although not Battletech related, this brings me to another couple pieces of news. More industry than anything, uh, the first is that War Machine hordes and all of the properties involved with those, like the P3 paint line and everything else, have been purchased by Steamforge Games. Honestly, I didn't even know that, that War Machine and Hordes was still alive, but apparently they are. The other thing is that Atomic Mass Games has announced that they will no longer be supporting X-Wing or Armada. Um, I wish Steamforge the best, and I'm sad to see X-Wing and Armada finally go, though it has probably been time to put those to rest for a while. Now, before we go into the main topic, I do want to say, if you want to support the channel and the podcast, you can do so by going to our Patreon at patreon.com slash unicorn company and becoming a member for as low as a dollar a month. Now, that last piece before I did that little, hey, please, please, uh, please join the Patreon uh, before I did that. I talked a little bit about Atomic Mass Games and um, Steam Forged and, and X-Wing and it getting the axe. And it brings us to our subject. That, that, that brings me to the subject of hobby tourists. I've been wanting to talk about this for a while, and I've never really known how exactly to approach this subject. The reason is that it seems to go hand in hand with the trend of certain people out there screaming at the top of their lungs about gatekeeping the hobby. I know you can't see the air quotes, but they are there. Anyway, these people seem to have dedicated themselves to sussing out those who they don't deem worthy of being a part of the hobby that they are in. And this ranges from Battletech to Warhammer 40k and just about every miniatures game that you can find. 
and it doesn't just include our corner of hobbies. It also seeps into things like fandoms in general. And what they don't seem to understand is that this is a fallacy, much like the no true Scotsman fallacy, and would preclude anyone, and I mean anyone, from being able to play any already established game. In Battletech, we've seen this idea of hobby tourists being pushed by a few creators, and while I'm not going to specifically point them out to anyone, I do want to give an example of this kind of thought process, if you can call it that, and how it ends up manifesting into what it's become. So I will be using a real, real world example without saying exactly who it is, though I'm sure some of you will know or figure it out. And I ask that you please leave this person alone. My my whole point of bringing this up is not to cause them any issues or harassment or anything like that, but to simply show this kind of process and how it works. Now, I am using this person and what happened, as I am knowledgeable on what has happened involving them and leading up to where things are now. And I wanted to, want to make clear to everyone that this isn't a problem that starts big. It is something that starts small and grows as time goes on. Also, no, this isn't a hit piece. This person is just a very good example of how this so-called hobby tourist mindset even happens. Now, this person began by releasing YouTube videos back in 2016, where he essentially made instructional videos on how to play the game. This included things like movement, heat, modifiers, and so forth. And he continued on this way for a while until he released a video about a year ago where he talked about his interaction with a transgender player, in which he constantly misgendered the player. I knew about this before the video was released, as she had reached out to a friend of mine after the incident, who then referred her to me. In talking to her, and by some of what he says in the video, it is made clear that he was a demo team agent at the time. I am not naming him or her, and ask that no one harass him over this, or anyone over this for that matter, as at this point, it has been handled. After everything happened and was settled, he felt the need to write a wall of text as a 2024 update in the description of the video defending his actions. After that video was made, though, while he was taking flack in his comment section from various people over how he behaved, and mind you, there were also people supporting him in there, um, he felt the need to release two more videos about a month later. The first of these is based on the premise of, as he calls them, individuals with power in groups and forums attempting, attempting to control fans and only allow certain viewpoints. This video goes on to talk about all sorts of things, from the Rommel to the Battletech subreddit. Throughout the video, he keeps referring to the unseen bad guy, the them, as it were, as activists, and talks about some sort of pushback that's coming. This is all done in a way that is reminiscent of someone standing in front of a cork board with pins and red string trying to connect the events of George Washington during the American Revolution to the fall of the Star League. Shortly after this, another video is released, this time explaining why he had to make the first video. And it is also in response to the first Pride Anthology. He talks about politics and social issues not being in fictional universes, all while ignoring the fact that the Battletech universe has always had some social issues baked into it, like any good science fiction. He also brings up the whole idea of Pride Flag Max being removed from the Reddit while not acknowledging that there were mechs that were literally in the livery of the German SS with the symbology from that era, which were allowed to stay, claiming the pride mechs were inherently political. He also makes sure to refer to those with a different viewpoint as activists and hobby tourists, and goes on another red string and pushpin reminiscent rant about how pride flags, pride itself, and LGBTQ representation is political. He then released three videos about an alternate timeline during the old clan era, which I'm not even going to go into. And after these, about four months ago in January, he released another video 
this one actually no it's more like six months why did i put four anyway um in this one as he puts it he's talking about the culture of violence and catalyst game labs where he looks to paint himself and his friends as victims he then talks about his own community and that he controls that that he does control access to and how in this echo chamber and i'm paraphrasing here 70 percent of people want an end to the political activism he then delves into the blaine pardo incident and then begins to attack one person after another attempting to character assassinate each person one of which he decides to defend another youtube channel in doing so and then culminates in a 10 minute long attempt at character assassination against one individual where he then goes on to talk about how violence shouldn't be allowed to exist in the hobby why did i decide that this is something that needs to be looked at well because there's something important to take away from this what started as him having an interaction with a trans player while acting as a representative of the game to everyone turned into him going deeper and deeper into his own echo chamber when there were consequences to the actions he took. He eventually went so far down the echo chamber that he decided he needed to make his own battle tech without blackjack and hookers, and along the way found like-minded people who only pushed him deeper and deeper into this mindset. Anyone who didn't agree with with him was an activist or a tourist and therefore bad further reinforcing what he thought that he was a victim in all of this his rants about cultures of violence communities and especially his attempted hit piece aren't about hobby tourism this is about him not liking people in the hobby some of them longtime hobbyists such as myself and decrying them and eventually the game to the point of him needing to create his own little pocket universe where he can control who can and can't be a part of it something he directly opposed in one of his earlier videos and even after this he still feels a need to put out a hit piece focusing on three people in particular with over a third of it being dedicated to one person this behavior isn't about hobby tourism. This behavior is about bigotry. So you might be asking yourself then, what is actual hobby tourism and is it good for the hobby? The short answer is it is someone trying out or playing games for a short time span. And yes, it is good. For this, I point to Two of the games that I brought up in the news segment, Warma Hordes, which was a where you just kind of switched the two words together because they work together as one game, and X-Wing. I have played both of these games and have enjoyed them. I have been a hobby tourist in that way, in the way that that's actually hobby tourism. Warma Hordes I played for about two years building armies, and generally enjoying the mix of steampunk and fantasy that it provided. I moved away from where I was and where I was able to play it, and so packed up my things, and now they sit in a closet in their foam trays. The same could be said of X-Wing. I played X-Wing for near, from near the beginning of the game's release, played in a couple regionals, collected and even customized the painting on the ships, and eventually, when second edition released, I felt it was time to leave. During the time that I played these games, I was what would be considered a hobby tourist. I wasn't interested in more than a few years of playing these. I had Battletech at home, a game I enjoyed much more and was much more involved with through projects at Sarna and BattletechUniverse.org. Privateer Press and Fantasy Flight Games made some money off of me, and I had a good time playing the games that they had created. Without hobby tourism, people wouldn't discover the games they like and spend years playing, sometimes buying into multiple forces or expansions off of the main game. Without hobby tourism, you wouldn't have the propagation of ideas that help to create better games. I mean, I have forces from multiple games, from Napoleonics to World War II and science fiction games, many packed away 
sometimes coming out if I find someone else who wants to play them or if I ever get an itch to go back and revisit the battlefields of Western Europe or the skies over the South Pacific. The modern use of hobby tourists as used by those who want to gatekeep people that they don't like out of their hobby, be it because they don't like their gender identity, sexual preference, political leanings, or for a myriad of other reasons, is not the same as what a hobby tourist actually is. The hobby tourist to them is a vile activist who comes to strip away everything they love about their game, and this just isn't true. While I wouldn't expect to see modern social issues on the fields at Waterloo or in the skies over Guadalcanal, in a game based in the future, be it cyberpunk or you know, which is in the near future or in a setting in the far future of the 32nd century or even the 41st. I feel it would be entirely possible, if not guaranteed. The reason is that in a universe like Battletech, not even getting into a nearly galaxy spanning science fiction universe like 40K, at least from the Imperial perspective, Mind you, because the other ones have chunks of the galaxy. But anyway, even from, you know, just that one perspective in there, you are going to have transgender people. You will have people who are good, bad, morally gray. You will have bigots, racists. You will have all of it, simply because the length and breadth of the setting is so big. I also want to point out something. Because people like the one I just talked about have attacked artists in places like Twitter and Facebook because those artists enjoy the painting and aesthetic of the games more than they enjoy the gameplay. I want to say that if you enjoy just one aspect of a game or hobby, if you are only interested in the lore or the aesthetic or painting miniatures or kit bashing, you are not doing it wrong. Battletech is for everyone. Wargaming is for everyone. And those who feel the need to gatekeep it and sequester themselves off in their closed off warrens will either fade into history or they will reemerge like a vault dweller in Fallout, only to find that while they preserve their idea of whatever their hobby should be, it has evolved, changed, and grown. And then, at that point, they will be the outsider. Now, since we've had a chance to talk about hobby tourism, which is a, a serious subject, um, I want to talk about something really amazing. Uh, something that spans the entire history of Battletech. And that thing would be the Marauder. So, I don't think I can give the Marauder the same kind of treatment that Tex did, for example, where it's super in-depth and there's just so much to uh, unpack. And Tex looked at it from a in-universe perspective. What I want to do is I want to look at this mech a little bit out of universe and then we're going to talk about some of the variants and that's simply because well it's a mech tech that's what we do and I, I don't think it gets enough attention on how it got into the universe or anything like that so let's let's talk about the marauder the Marauder began its life as the Glaug officer pod in the Robotech and Macross universes. Or universe, or... Okay, I'm not up to snuff on Robotech or Macross, but needless to say, it was something imported from another setting. This design would be repurposed into the 75-ton Marauder, a heavy mech in the Battletech universe, which was originally fielded by the Starlink Defense Force and eventually found its way into the rest of the Inner Sphere and even went with the clans to evolve into the Marauder 2C. 
The Marauder itself is a simple machine and elegant in its own way with a particle projection cannon and medium laser housed in each arm and a single auto, fi auto cannon five and a dorsal mount in the right torso. Now, this is an interesting bit in the lore as though it is a right torso mounted weapon, the actual mount depicted in the art and on the miniature is center line on the mech. While there is no in-universe explanation for this officially that I know of, I mean, there could be, I, I don't know everything, but there is no explanation for this incongruity that I know of. When MechWarrior Online was made, they moved the physical location of the weapon to the right torso. In looking at the aesthetic changes, though, the Marauder has spent a lot of time finding itself. And when I say a lot of time, I mean it. The machine was part of the unseen purge that happened within the lawsuit with Harmony Gold occurred, all because of someone misrepresenting their ability to license the rights for it, as well as the incident with Exo Squad, which I think deserves an entire episode all on its own. Although, that's more of a toy episode and there are channels far better at covering that than I am. Although if they are looking to do it, I know a lot about that and I can be a consultant for you um, if you need to poke and ask questions. Anyway, one of the solutions to this and what can be seen as the one with the most mixed opinions was Project Phoenix, where the new developers of Battletech at the time, and if I remember right, it was FanPro, they decided to put out a technical readout that would reintroduce the unseen mechs. One of these was obviously the Marauder. While there were some gems like the Warhammer 2C and the Rifleman, fight me on that, the Marauder and the 2C for that matter were duds. The redesign took them from sleek and intimidating to, well, not. There was a further effort to revitalize the designs in the prototype mechs, as well as some experimentals. Because of this, we ended up with the Marauder 4X, a house Merrick design using binary lasers in the arms and an SRM-6 in each side torso. When looking at this design, you can see a number of things that we would further see in the new classics or the new scene, as some people call it. In fact, this is one of my favorite versions of the Marauder in miniature form. As with just a little bit of plastic card to cover the SRM ports and a bit of an auto cannon barrel, you can get a very convincing standard Marauder. Finally, though, after years of hard work, dedication, and with a little help in repelling Harmony Gold one final time, we ended up with the new classic or new scene Marauder that is sleek, sexy, yet angular. It gives you the feeling of a menacing yet graceful machine. One thing I do want to bring up before I go a little bit into the variants and the, the configurations of the Marauder is I mentioned the Project Phoenix Marauder. I don't know who out there is listening who was around when when those came out. I, I obviously was there. Um, the unseen or the the Project Phoenix mechs were a nightmare to assemble, generally because multiple parts. And when I say multiple parts, I'm talking like legs that were three parts each and stuff like that. Um, I do have a Archer review video where I talk about the way that its legs are assembled, and this is the new version. And I, I get I get a little bit of a flashback to the Project Phoenix stuff, but it's nowhere near as bad. If any of you are listening and you remember that, let me know because I want to find out how many people were so frustrated with with the Project Phoenix machines and trying to put them together in some way that didn't just look or feel ridiculous. That being said, I have nerded out way too much over the real world aspects of the Marauder and looking at it outside of the game. And I think it would be great to sit down and have a discussion with some people about this because like this is 
that's a huge chunk of the game's history and it we only have it by the grace of harmony gold just totally screwing themselves over in court so thank you to pgi thank you to catalyst let's look at the marauder now as far as the actual specs the the nitty-gritty of the marauder and of course starting off we have the mad-1r marauder it is the granddaddy of all the marauders out there and yet it isn't this variant of the marauder represents the first of the marauders built by general motors for the star league defense force and it doesn't disappoint the Marauder 1R is 75 tons of Angry, built on a standard chassis and powered by a 300-rated engine that gives it a ground speed of 64 kilometers per hour when it's pushed all the way. The mech is protected with 14 tons of ferrofibrous armor with cellular ammunition storage equipment, or case, for the ammunition, and cooled by 16 single heat sinks. The 1R establishes the classic Marauder weapons payload and, and placement with a particle projection cannon and medium laser mounted in the weapons pods on the end of each arm. They're backed up by a single auto cannon 5 mounted in the right torso of the mech that sits almost center line on top of the mech somehow. Anyway, with the weapons payload, if you cycle between two PPCs and one PPC in the auto cannon, you can keep the mech relatively cool using only the medium lasers when the enemy gets into short range, under the minimum range of the PPCs. The 1R has a battle value of 1420. Now, in Alpha Strike, the 1R is a battle mech size 3, TMM of 1, movement of 8 is a sniper and comes in at 37 points. For firepower, it has a short of two with a medium and a long of three and one overheat. It has six structure and seven armor. And for specials, the one R has case. Overall, it's a good design. It's sort of a trooper in Alpha Strike at that point, that 30, um, 37 points. A little bit of an expensive trooper, but a trooper. And it's a good design. It's not exceptional, but it's not, you know... It's not something that you look and go, yeah, I don't know. It, it's a decent design, especially for when it was made for the game. Well, when it was made in the universe and in its place in the success. Uh, yeah, I can't talk. The Star League in the Succession Wars era, early Succession Wars, obviously. Now, the upgrade to this, which was built for the Royal Divisions in 2760, is the MAD-2 Armor Honor. The 2R is a straightforward upgrade of the design. Replaces the standard heat sinks with 16 double heat sinks. But then it goes and it upgrades its PPCs to ER PPCs, giving it a longer range reach at the cost of heat. Um, now, due to the lack of a minimum range on the ER PPCs, the Marauder 2R is capable of using those weapons at short range which truly turned the medium lasers into full-on backup weapons. And they also have the side effect of, at short range, you can fire one PPC, the auto cannon, and two medium lasers. And I think you can walk, because that's 15, 25. Yeah, no, you can, you can probably run, fire that loadout at short range. And you are you are golden and if you really need to you can fire everything but then you're going to be spiking the heat so yeah the marauder 2r is really a good short range brawler for being a sniper and the battle value of it is 1630 and it's simply because it handles its heat way better even with the extra heat from the erp pcs in Alpha Strike, the double heat sinks and lack of minimum range make the 2R a very nasty machine. The 2R is battle mech, size 3, TMM1, movement of 8, and a sniper at 40 points even. So points-wise, we are out of the trooper and more into your, your mech that can hit. 
The 2R has damage values of 4 at short and medium, with long at 3, no overheat value because of its heat efficiency, and for protection it has armor of 7 and structure of 6, with the special of case, once again, making it very effective for the period, and still, because it's still available in the old clan era, it is still a formidable opponent, from an inner sphere perspective at least, in the ill clan era. Now, after that, we get to the iconic MAD-3R. And this is when I said that the 1R was the granddaddy of all marauders, and yet it isn't. This is the one that most people remember. It is the marauder that is seen in technical readout 3025 on the cover of that in that beautiful art, and is one of the most iconic battle mechs in the Battletech universe. This variant of the Marauder was the one most commonly seen and subsequently modified throughout the Inner Sphere during the Succession Wars. It's built with a standard engine, standard structure, standard armor, no case, and has an identical weapons loadout to the MAD-1R. The only major changes is that it does only have 11.5 tons of armor, making it a bit thin-skinned in comparison. And it also drops the case. So it no longer can stand up to an ammunition explosion. Uh, the battle value of this very standard and very well-known variant of the Marauder is 1363. Now in Alpha Strike, the 3 r Marauder is a tight battle mech, size 3, TMM1, movement of 8. And it's a sniper with a point value of 35. For offensive capabilities, it is similar to the 1R with 2 at short, 3 at medium and long, with an overheat of 1. It has slightly less armor with 6 armor and 6 structure and no special abilities. So if you get an ammo hit on this, it, it's out. Um, so basically, if you crit on a 2 or a 12, this machine is gone. Now... The next Marauder that is the R series, and I'm using the R series because I feel like these are the standard base model Marauders. And the next one we have is the 5R. And it is, like I said, the, the standard variant of the Marauder after the Helm memory core is discovered. Mind you though, after the Helm memory core is discovered, Standard anything sort of flew out the door. Um, the 5R is built by or built around an extra light engine and it's cooled by 17 double heat sinks. It does have 14 tons of armor to protect it from damage and it's built to work as a brawler but as part of a team. This whole teamwork part is reinforced through the use of a C3 slave system. And with its primary weapons being a pair of ERPPCs, one in each arm, with a standard medium laser also mounted in each arm, it's very much like the, the 2R. You know, you've got the, you have the 14 tons of armor. Yes, you have a C3 system, so it can communicate with friendly mechs. You have the ERPPCs and medium lasers. But then, then we take a fun little turn because those weapons are supported by a rotary auto cannon 5 with two tons of ammunition in the right torso. This makes the 5R a vicious close range brawler as it is able to hose down its targets with a stream of depleted uranium shells as it savages them with PPCs and lasers. The 5R has a battle value of 1877. And I'm sorry if I sounded a little giddy there, but I just auto cannoned to go burr. I, I, yeah. There's a little bit of that Davianista left in me. I, I, I play as a Merc all the time now, but a Capellan leaning Merc, but a Merc. And yeah, um, auto cannon go burr. Anyway. 
In Alpha Strike, it is a type battle mech, size 3, TMM of 1, with a movement of 8. It is a brawler and comes in at 41 points. The 5R is capable of doing 5 damage at short and medium ranges. With a long of 2 and an overheat value of 1. The mech has armor of 7, structure of 3, with the specials of C3 Slave, Case, ECM, and Mech, mech Headquarters 1. This is a decent variant of the mech in Alpha Strike. The only downside to this, in my opinion, is the C3, because unless you are using it in a C3 network, you are paying a points tax on that simply because the game, the way it's pointed, assumes that you will be using a C3 network. So if you're not using a C3 network, you're probably paying one or two points over what you should actually be paying for the mech if it didn't have the C3 network. The last of the standard or R family of the Marauders we have is the MAD-7R. Now, this machine began production in 3103 in Lyran space and is distributed widely throughout the Inner Sphere. It is essentially the Ill Clan era standard Marauder. The MAD-7R is built on a standard structure and powered by a 300 extra light engine. This allows the mech to have a great deal of space for weapons, equipment, and armor. The 7R is protected by 12 and a half tons of ferrofibrous armor with case 2, essentially making it where ammunition explosions will not cripple the mech. Uh, the 7R has as its primary weapons a pair of ERPPCs, one in each arm. These are backed up at long range by a right torso mounted light gauss rifle with two tons of ammunition stored in the center torso. The Case 2 system protects the mech from catastrophic failures of the light gauss rifle. And for close range engagements, the 7R carries a medium X pulse laser in each arm, giving it a pretty good short range punch. This is cooled by 15 double heat sinks, and the mech does have, have some additional utility from the fact that it has a built in Guardian ECM suite which does allow it to interfere with advanced enemy electronic systems like C3 and, and I don't think, doesn't affect, I think it affects Artemis or it affects Narc Beacons, I can't remember. Um, now the 7R would eventually spawn the 7C for use by the Republic and the 11D uh, for deployment with House Davian. The 7R has a battle value of 1832. In Alpha Strike, the 7R is a battle mech, size 3 with a TMM of 1 and a movement of 8 jump. It is a sniper and comes in at 38 points. For this, you get a mech capable of hitting at 3 at short and long ranges with a medium value of 4. It does have an overheat value of 1, allowing it to push its damage value up just a little bit when needed. The 7R has good armor protection of 7, but only has 3 structure due to the XL engine. For specials, it has Case 2, making it impervious to ammunition explosions, and it has the ECM special ability, allowing it to interfere with enemy C3 networks. This pretty much covers the Marauder, at least the R series, which could be looked at, like I said, as the mainline variants, the, the base model. And that goes all the way back to the 1R. Um, I will be doing an extended look at every factory Marauder variant over on the Patreon, which you can join as a paid member to get extras, exclusives, and at the $5 and up tier, you will be entered to win various products that I have had the opportunity to review. I want to thank our sponsor, Fortress Miniatures and Games. If you need anything for Battletech, check out their website at fortressminiaturesandgames.com. Also, we've become an affiliate with the Scrapyard Orc, who makes wonderful Battletech-themed dice. If you follow the affiliate link in the description, you will not only be able to buy some awesome dice, but when buying through the affiliate link, you will help to support the podcast and the channel. Finally, I want to thank my patrons. Above all, you help make this possible. Thank you, each and every one.
This is Carrie signing off. I'm gonna find my meaning, I can make a change. I wanna play the game. You wanna sink or swim? I'm gonna go down swinging. Go deep within. I get lost in the field, just need a win. I'm going off, I know it's time to make a change. And I can take the pain. You wanna sink or swim? I'm gonna go down swinging. Go deep within. I get lost in the field, just need a win. I'm gonna find my meaning, I can make a change. I wanna play the game. Yeah, I figured this would happen. All right, guys, gals, and MD pals, let's go out there and hold off the keyboard warriors. <laughs>